Welcome to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Zach. With me, as always, is Alex McCumbers. And Alex, hey, do you everybody. Wanna, do you want to introduce our new friend here? Uh, so we have Joe Seesman. Seamson? Seamson? Yes, no? Seamson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always look at it and, like, parts of my brain rearranges it, and so it gets really confusing sometimes. Yeah, so we've got Joe. You all probably know Joe from the Kingdom Hearts episode. Yep, that's how they all know me. <laughs> You'd be surprised. We've got quite a few people listening. It's pretty trippy sometimes. Well, hello. So, Zach, what do we got on the docket today? We have got some stuff about awesome games done quick. A lot of things about our most anticipated games of 2020. A little bit of listener mail. Mm, one we forgot. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And uh, we're going to just go over some new stuff here with Joe and the Forever Classic website and what we're doing with that together. As well as, you know, end up where we usually do, talking about the stuff that we're doing right now. I guess we'll go ahead and make that announcement now then, man. So, for the longest time, me and Zach have always kind of kept Forever Classic Games really close to our chests. We've had a bunch of friends come to us a time or two, asking to either be a part of the site or work on some stuff involving with board games, you know, whatever. And we really wanted to kind of distill what we were doing before we added anybody else. Most importantly, we wanted to wait till we can pay people. Well, I was actually approached by our friend Joe here, and he's kind of looking for some ways to be more creative in his day-to-day life. And so he really wanted to jump on and join Forever Classic Games and offer for some of his video and visual skills. So, Joe, if you would, please introduce yourself to all our listeners and viewers. Hello, I am uh, Joe Simpson. I have a background in video and animation work where I do a lot of mo- uh, video editing and motion graphics is primarily what I do. And along with that, since it is a passion of mine, I'm always working on personal projects and things like that. And one of those is a YouTube series that I created called Daddy Gamer, a gaming review channel where we take a look at video games through the lens of being a father, but it's also a lot of just like like silly skits and jokes that I do with my daughter, who is my co-host. And so the video games themselves are more of a launching pad for jokes and silly bits that we do. But I do take some time every episode to look at that game from the perspective, how did being a dad directly impact my experience? And so that's, that's a part of it. The problem with the format of that show is it's hard to record it when my daughter is at school. Before she went to school, it was easy because I'd just be like, hey, I finished the script. All right, let's do it. You're home with me all day, so let's just uh, get it recorded. So I've just been feeling this like outlet that I need. I still am creating Daddy Gamer, but I wanted another outlet for just regular creation. And that I saw an opportunity with the Forever Classic website and creating content with them and uh, approached Alex, who I've been writing with alongside with uh, Marooners Rock for a while now and uh, seemed like it might be a good fit. So we're going to give this a go and hopefully all, all goes well. And we're pretty excited to have you. And just to be completely transparent, you are helping us out on a volunteer basis. We still don't have the means to actually pay people like we want to. Wait, <laughs> what? Is... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Shut her down. <laughs> but no, no we're, so you, you are we're really us excited out based on you. what you want to do. And you're kind of just given free reign, really. I mean, we're, we've got some areas we want to focus on, you know, some uh, retro inspired games in particular, a lot of different projects coming up this month, but for the most part, you're just here helping us out. And, stretching your legs creatively and we're excited for that future Mm -hmm. we hope it's everything that you're looking forward to man yeah i hope i hope it is um i've been really inspired by and influenced by some youtubers that i've been really excited about lately and i'm like man it'd be great to create content like them but i just don't have the outlet i'd have to create a whole new channel and like start from scratch with all those things i also am looking for an opportunity to work more collaborative in a more collaborative environment and i think that this is a really great avenue for that yeah, we, we have a pretty cool little little space of the internet we've carved out, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it, personally. Same, and I think that we're just carving out a little bit more every day. Every day, all the time getting bigger, which is cool, because I think that we're making really meaningful content. Yeah, you know, it's not like we jumped on the scene and we're like fucking double S rank, like awesome, like stuff that everybody knows. I mean, we're totally double S rank awesome, but not everybody knows this yet. But yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're climbing. We're getting, we're getting to meet awesome people and they're really cool to talk to. 
That's my favorite part of this gig and why I kind of started Forever Classic Games was creating an outlet for these like deeper dives and getting to talk to developers and really trying to understand where those games come from. That way it's helpful for developers, helpful for hobbyists like us and just players in general. People that want to know more about the games. Right. And this has helped me develop lots of my back end technical skills around sound. Like uh, from school, of course, I was very well versed in like a lot of live production stuff, but I never touched sound, audio, like this type of video production. And it's it's given me a really good outlet. And I think since we started, I've gotten significantly better at it. Our sound has improved like dozens fold from both of us working on it from either side. Yeah, and we're using the same tools that I used in radio. So like I learned the foundation there and now I'm just learning how to like fine tune a bunch of stuff. And then Joe, you'll probably learn some audio stuff too. Well, as a part of my background, audio is already pretty important with video. Yeah, so you've probably got a pretty good foundation in that too. So Zach, let's go right into the news, man. There's been some pretty cool things happening this week in the past couple weeks and a lot of these top stories are things that have been kind of stewing for a while except for this big one so awesome games done quick just wrapped up as we're recording this the night before and they have successfully raised over 3.1 million dollars for prevent cancer foundation and it was a heck of a finale i got to watch most of it i didn't get to see closing ceremonies but i saw the mario maker race and i saw a lot of the metroid stuff yeah i basically watched the last half day straight and it was all just there was a um, a link to the past a legend of zelda randomizer yeah uh, that was really spectacular because they added the crowd control so people mm-hmm. could donate bits to eat, give him a heart to take away a bomb <laughs> or just straight up kill him yeah so he'd be crowd in the control is incredible He'd be in the middle of a boss fight and just be dead. Uh, a lot of a lot of people were combining things like, all right, we're going to activate for a minute. It's one hit kill. But then they would also throw in like a cuckoo attack for a minute. Oh, so no. he'd be dodging <laughs> all of these chickens, like all of the place. Uh, just hilarious. And That's the guy, so cool. he still beat the game in like two and a half hours, three hours. These guys are professional. He's just like really took it in stride. He had a, probably one of the best couches in the stream just hilarious commentary but the rest of the evening with the mario maker race that was exciting when i intended summer games done quick live that was the first year that they had done the mario maker relay race that room was packed oh yeah yeah they get really really excited just the the energy in that room people cheering and jumping up and down and screaming and yelling for people playing mario and it was man i it was just definitely very glad i was there that day for that and now it's become a staple i think of the event the last three or four more times that they've done it yeah so there's two things that they like to end with is something to do with metroid and then the the mario maker stuff yeah and so then they did the the metroid super metroid impossible which is a rom hack that was supposedly unbeatable when it was first made like mid 2000s and now they they were saying like now we are now we're here like 14 years later and uh we've got deathless runs <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> and it's just like it was incredible and then afterwards they did this whole like 10 year like thanking everybody and i don't know how many people stuck around to watch it but they there was like a a five to ten minute long video like a short documentary about the last 10 years that they've been doing this interviews with runners it was actually really moving uh and re- just like really appreciative of the community it really showcased certain moments that were like really big and important in the gdq's history and then uh credits rolled and then they sent the stream they host they raided some random speedrunner in australia oh, so man. this this speedrunner who's playing xenoblade chronicles on wii suddenly has 125,000 people in stream <laughs> that's incredible <laughs> and they handled it really well they were like oh hey guys thanks for joining thanks for the raid and they were, they were just like answering questions and just excited like they they didn't like there wasn't a pop-off oh yeah so it's just pretty it was but it was just fun to see that immediate their first response to ending the event was to like support someone in the speedrunning community that's awesome that's that, fantastic that's what's really great about twitch right is every time you have like a good show you try to pass that on to the next person and so i i like that games done quick themselves are doing that that's really really cool yeah and no, a positive side of rating very good the other thing that i saw was i watched the medieval speed run i only got to watch a couple runs this year and that was one of them a medieval was fantastic definitely check out that 
particular run on YouTube. It had Dave Oshry, who was on the show before, and the New Blood Interactive devs, and they were in the chat just, like, being amazed at stuff. <laughs> it was really funny. They're like, and uh, now we're gonna skip a boss. And Dave would be like, what? How? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and they do this weird jump like it out into the middle of distance and like things would blow by and eventually they would hit a spot and then that would load the next level and the one dev was like how'd you guys figure this out and the runner's like it wasn't me <laughs> somebody else <laughs> <laughs> And we did, in the show notes, leave a thread that somebody made on Reddit, which includes the AGDQ schedule as it happened with links to each individual VOD. So that's in the show notes. Go check that out if you want to watch a particular run and maybe like a block or something. Highlights for me was uh, someone ran the entire Fallout anthology. Oh yeah, you were telling me about that one. And that one was really cool. The guy did a really phenomenal job explaining some of the like the various glitches and stuff that they utilize to the point that he even brought like a diagram made out of cups and cardboard. Oh, cool. To showcase like a level. And then he had like a little like stick figure person, popsicle stick figure. And he's like, all right, this is you and you're here and we need to do this. And then it makes you go like this. And he's doing this during a cut scene in the game that's unskip. You can't skip. So he's like, uh, okay. he's, got, he's like, I've got 45 seconds to explain how this glitch works to you. So he had like props and stuff. At one point, he's explaining a glitch about how like, all right, we need to, in order to beat this the fastest time, we need to increase our speed by like 800%. The best way to do that is to put on eight pairs of pants. So we need to duplicate our inventory and our ability to equip pants. And so he made <laughs> someone on the couch put on a pair of pants every time his character put on a pair of pants. That's incredible. That's really fun. Yeah. They also did a Legend of Zelda 1, 2, and 3. So Legend of Zelda 1 through 3 race. So they had relay race. So when one game ended, a new runner would come in and start the next game. That one was really cool. We already mentioned some of the other ones. The two player, one controller blindfolded punch out run. I heard this really was really cool. Good. Yeah. I was like, they did it first try. No failures at all. Just perfect run. And wow. I was just like, <laughs> that's, I. That's That's awesome. <laughs> So if you're interested in this sort of thing, definitely go and like subscribe to the YouTube channel for Games Done Quick. All of these get uploaded as individual runs that you can check out later. Really quickly too. It's like almost immediately after they happen. Right. It's... It's pretty, they're on top of it. I, I don't remember which YouTuber is helping them out with that. It was either Summoning Salt or Omnigamer. I don't remember. I have no idea. Either way, no Summoning clue. Salt has some great, like, documentary sort of breakdowns about, like, the progression of a particular world record. Those are really interesting, too. I definitely recommend those. Huh. Other news, are we, uh, I assume that. Keep uh, going. Yeah, let's go down the yeah. rundown. The Pokemon Direct this week. Yeah, I watched it, personally. Was uh, some of the bigger news. My initial reaction is, I'm excited about the content. I am not excited about the price point uh oh think of it this way let me pitch this to you okay so <laughs> all of that extra stuff right usually in an additional third version of the game now you're paying half as much for it and you're getting it added to your current adventure without having to start over. Is it half as much when the base game costs $20, at least $20 more than previous games? Mm. Mm, you do have a point there. They used to be 40 bucks. Yep, and yeah, now they're, they're, they're starting to balance out. And mm. so now... We were paying additional 30 and so now at this point, you've paid almost more than double the price of a previous game to get yeah. what feels like a f finished full game. Some of that content was stuff that I was like, I beat it, and I was like, all right, here's some of the things I missed about previous generations. And then the yeah. Pokemon director was like, here's that stuff you missed. And I'm like, oh, great, okay. is it free? And then they're like, no, it's $30. And uh, I was like, unless you mm, get it traded from a friend, $30. then you can get those Pokemon specifically. But I think it's really cool. I'm excited <laughs> for all the different new areas. We're getting two. We're getting one in the spring and one in the fall. And the titles of these are the Isle of Armor first. And then after that, we're going to the Crown Tundra, which is like a foresty kind of wintry sort of area. All of these areas in the concept art, I think look really cool. And I'm excited to see the different approaches to like that style of game because now the developers have the freedom to not really worry about okay what's the next one we're gonna do now they're adding to what's already there and so that opens up a lot of options for development i think and i'm personally excited for it i'm down to pay the 30 bucks personally because it's going to be like way after the fact and for one i didn't pay for the game it was a gift haha <laughs> thanks eli <laughs> <laughs> i'm playing it now i just started pokemon sword over the weekend i think the other thing so i'd written up a uh 
like kind of a when they announced it people had no idea they're like well the game's out what are they announcing or what are they talking about in this i had written up like a kind of like uh wanting to get the news out that they had announced it but i also wrote down like what some of my predictions were and one of them was are we going to see a a mystery dungeon revival because we haven't seen one of those in a while and that was the first thing they talked about in the in the direct was new pokemon mystery dungeon demo available now remake of the gba slash ds ones that red and blue version yes so it is it is is revisiting a previous game but uh, i do know that uh we so my daughter and i streamed her playing through the demo or a portion of the demo i don't know how far in we got but yeah she's had a lot of fun with it she needed some help with you know reading because she's five but uh she definitely had fun with it and yeah i'm excited for it i never did like the mystery dungeon games specifically that genre is kind of obtuse to me in how like all the different systems kind of play together i get why people would like it those games just aren't for me usually because i've played the pokemon mysteries i've played sheer and the wanderer which uh was one of the like main spinoffs of that genre i've played a bunch of different ones but they never quite clicked mm, i never knew that, that. I mean, style it, is, cool, though. it is a pretty simplified like dungeon dungeon crawler experience but i think someone more like you know a five-year-old might be more of their target audience for those anyway yeah now things you can get now in pokemon sword and shield is if you do fork up the 30 dollars today you can get uh, some new costumes for your characters which people like look and fly so i mean now you can wear a costume with got some uh pikachu and eevee themes on them and you can also catch a galarian slowpoke but can't be evolved until you get the new content so you can just get the slowpoke you meet the character that's gonna take you on those adventures depending on what version you have i just did that because i was in the area that's like like the starting area and so i've got the goofy looking slowpoke now uh, <laughs> in a box <laughs> I, you're tell useless you what, though, to me for now i picked grookey i named him business you know why monkey business <laughs> <laughs> i love him he's a little drummer dude like he's super cool i like oh i just realized that uh it might be <clears throat> so a drum a famous drummer died this yeah, week neil peart yeah of rush yeah of rush and he he that Rush, they're the band that made my favorite album, Time, 2112. Great album. So I'm wondering if maybe it might be kind of a nice, like, at least for more for myself, just rename my big gorilla drummer after him. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. I definitely, when I heard that news, fired up, like, the greatest hits on Rush when I was driving. Oh, uh, I've been basically listening to their entire discography the last few days. It's really sad. Trying to pay extra attention to the drums in each song and how, like, their impact. They're just overall, they're all just very talented musicians. And one thing I loved about them is they never stopped creating. They always had this drive to keep writing new music, so. Yeah, I really enjoyed, from a drumming perspective, listening to Dream Theater and Rush kind of back-to-back because both of those drummers are so technical and they always find either a new type of drum or a new thing to hit, which just created more options in the tracks altogether. So you had this wide variety of like sound options from a drummer's perspective and they kind of utilized like everything. True. One of the things I was really interested with the uh, Pokemon DLC was I've been expecting it to come at some point. Mm-hmm. Whether it was this game, the last game, even the games before it, granted, but they didn't really have a way to. Is they're just really slow to add on things that are like commonplace. Yeah. So like DLC has been commonplace for everybody and the fact that they've added it now like so late in the game makes it exciting yeah it's cool to see nintendo actually doing things that everybody else has been doing for 15 years kudos to them <laughs> yeah yeah I, I don't unfortunately the side effect side effect of that is that because they're new to it some of their methods seem a little like you're kind of like wait what yeah most it doesn't work super well like playing smash brothers online still sucks you have to pay to trade pokemon online now the idea of uh taking on Dynamax Pokemon as like a raid battle with my friends sounds amazing, but there is literally no good system to set that up. Yeah, like there's no. a weird password system that apparently only works like half the time mm-hmm. and it's just a pain in the butt and it's not very intuitive. And especially now that they finally added like actual friends lists, you should be able to like set up something where you can be like, send an invitation to my online Pokemon friends to come help me with this Dynamax battle. That seems to be the case for a lot of Japanese development because Monster Hunter is in the same boat. Like playing with uh, our group, the three of us is usually kind of a pain in the butt because we have to like go in, watch the cutscene. All right, now everybody's seen the cutscene, go back in. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's just a Monster Hunter thing, but actually getting together a lot easier than it used to be. Oh yeah, yeah, it's way better now than it was. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Check this out. One day we're going to be able to play Monster Hunter on the PlayStation 5, and that day's coming soon because apparently. 
apparently the PlayStation 5 will play PS4 games, so they've said, I think, in a couple interviews. But we had a bunch of information come out of the CES event. So this is the Consumer Electronics Show. I don't remember where it took place. But a lot of different developers came and showed off a bunch of hardware. Sony, in particular, showed off, like, a car and some of their audio stuff. But for us gamers, the important stuff was they gave us a bunch of data about PlayStation. And they revealed the logo for PS5, which is about what you would think it is. <laughs> It's very, very simple. So one thing I've been noticing, is particularly on Reddit, Reddit took that new logo and just had a field day with it because they're oh, yeah. like, oh, ho, ho. like how intuitive of them. They like they did this. And someone created like a graphic where it shows them grabbing the S from place like the PS part and then flipping it and turning it into a five and then like making a slight adjustment. And they're like, this is how they created the logo. And like it's like making fun of it. But literally in the comments, every single graphic designer was like, but that's that's how fun work that's literally <laughs> that's literally what graphic designers do and everyone else is like look at what they did that is silly <laughs> 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 it's really cool because like if it's not broke don't fix it right that's what i like about playstation they always kind of elevate and they keep things the same in a lot of ways just be glad it's not the spider-man font yeah, yeah, I mean, eh, eh, it's fine. <laughs> Anyways, well, 106 million PS4 units have been sold, and 1.15 billion PS4 games have been sold. That's a lot of units out in the wild. It's a huge install base. I think they said it's, like, the second most sold co home console, specifically, of all time, compared to, I think, the PS2 was the, the top one. Yeah, PS2 so is still, like, Sony. strong. Yeah. I think even late into the early PS4, Sony was still reporting new sales of new PS4. PS2s. Yeah. yeah. I don't know they're, where they're... people were buying brand new PS2s, but... Probably Brazil. Very popular in Brazil. <laughs> but, you know, also thinking about, remember when they announced the PS3 and the prototype controller was like a boomerang or a banana? I want one. <laughs> <laughs> It would be a cool collector's piece, but right, man, yeah. it did not look comfortable to hold. Uh, mm, I love weird controllers. I mean, you have a controller that's a blob, so. Yeah, the slime controller that I will be playing with eventually once I get myself a copy of Dragon Quest. Thanks to Izzy for sending that to me for a birthday, I think. That was really cool. <laughs> over. I'm sending you something, I promise. It's on the way. So 5 million PSVR units have been sold. That's not bad, I don't think. I don't have any numbers to compare it to other VSR, uh, VR units, but that's a pretty decent install base for PlayStation. They also were reported 103 million active users monthly on PSN and 38.8 million PS Plus subscribers monthly. So if you think about that number in particular, not everybody playing online are using PS Plus. So they're playing something like Fortnite or something where you don't necessarily need that. And yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah. PS5 details that were reconfirmed include 3D audio sound. So they're really pushing the like spatial audio that they have, the tech there. Haptics and adaptive triggers. That includes on the new DualShock, I assume is what they're going to call it. They they talked about in an interview where if you're like pulling a bowstring, that trigger is going to get tighter and you'll actually like feel the pressure of that bowstring. So that could be really fascinating, but probably won't be included in all games and likely only like first party stuff. Now, I'm really excited for haptic feedback and controllers, yeah. but there's one thing I specifically want with haptic feedback. Yeah. Gloves. Ooh. I want controller gloves again with haptic feedback. Power glove. So there's actually, so I don't think, I don't know how long we, far away we are from this being a thing in virtual reality or in gaming, but I was watching on tested YouTube channel. They went to this company and they had this setup where he's got these gloves and they are synced to another set of like robotic arms. And he oh, was cool. able to control that arm with his hand, reach down and pick up a ball. It's got all these sensors in the fingers and he can feel the pressures of the ball so it's like these like these bubbles and it sends and replicates the same force in the gloves itself and so that you can know how much pressure you're applying to something so theoretically you could pick up an egg and not shatter it right so you're not just grabbing an egg and just uh you can you can know when to stop picking up that egg and he was able to p take the ball and toss it from one hand into the other. And they're working on this technology to the point that the goal is if you need a life-saving surgery and the only surgeon that's available is on the other side of the planet, they could oh. use this setup to perform that life-saving surgery because there, there's still a lot of things an, like analytical and in-the-moment things and decisions that need to be made that you know robots and lenses aren't able to quite pick up yet. You know, judgment calls and things like that about a person's will to live and all of those things are just too many variables to like code into a software so if we can give use what we can to give that control over to someone 
actual, but from the other side of the planet. Because they they they've been they were testing it. The physical hardware was in Los Angeles, right? And the the gloves were in the UK. Oh, cool! And the response time was actually like almost exact, like perfect. That's really neat. The other area that I think that would be super handy in is things like bomb defusal. Yeah, yeah that'd they, be they, they, they specifically talked about that too. Which they're already using something similar, but something that's like way intuitive that you can actually feel things like that would increase the success. <laughs> it's just like a rack with these arms hanging from it. Yeah, it'd be perfect. Put a bunch of like armor plating on that thing. And there's a lot of cool things that you could do with that technology. And uh, VR gloves do kind of exist. And specifically in the realm of VR for something similar, I do believe it's available now. The Oculus Quest has the uh, the hand tracking software built into it now. So you don't necessarily need a controller in some situations where you're just using like pickup throws and that type of thing. And I'm pretty certain that's available now. If not for Oculus Quest, then for Oculus and the other brands of those headsets. I think the Rift S is... I wonder if it would be made better if you got gloves with a specific pattern on them for better Maybe. tracking versus Maybe. just your bare hands. Yeah, but they were really interested in doing bare hands specifically. Right, for um, more, more accessibility but I wonder if Was someone who wanted to invest a little bit extra just to see getting a pair of gloves with the uh, the motion tracking pattern on them that they typically use for like movies and things. If they got now, those, I wonder if that would be better. Well, even on top of that, they have a they just came out with a piece of tech. Um, I believe they showcased it with somebody had this thing that looked like a big riot shield. Okay. And it's supposed to be a type of like optical camouflage. So Ooh. it's just a shield full of cameras that bend the image of what's behind it not to be there by just just replacing it on front something like that even built into like your glove setup for say surgeons that way you can see even extra micro details while you're doing things specifically there we're getting really close to metal gear levels of tech <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're there. It's just nobody's actually executing. The government it has them already. We just don't know about. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> PS5 details, though, kids. The other thing that is something that you could do now, if you wanted to, you can rip out your uh, hard drive and put in a solid state drive, and it will actually make your PlayStation run better. A lot of Monster Hunter players do this to reduce the amount of load times and increase your performance overall. But they they are just having an ultra high high speed SSD built into the PS4. We're also getting getting hardware-based ray tracing. That'll be really cool. I've seen some ray tracing tech utilized in things like Quake 2, which is really cool. And then I've seen it in games like Battlefield on these super nice laptops that Razer had. Right. And so ray tracing is like this super advanced lighting thing. And it just makes games more detailed in lighting specifically, I think. I don't know exactly what you can utilize with it, but lighting seems to be the main area that people are playing around in. Yeah, lighting in, uh, it helps with a bunch of the other information uh, transfer too. Oh, for things like hit scan too, it'd work probably. Yes. And, um, oh, what was it? I believe it was because I play a lot of Fortnite. And one of the things I believe when I was playing hot and heavy was that when one of the John Wick events came out, they had a ray tracing scene that they did with things that they released for everybody in hopes, I believe, that they want to include ray tracing into Fortnite when it's commonplace available for everything. So this PS5. is pretty exciting. It's coming. The, the big selling point, I think, that's going to actually sell a lot of units because PlayStation has always kind of been at the forefront of the, the idea of having it be your main living room entertainment. They are including Ultra HD Blu-ray players in this thing. So now you can take your, your really high quality movies, watch them in your living room on your PlayStation, probably at a price that's really competitive to an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. So most people that are like, I want a new way to watch movies, they're going to look to the PlayStation. Well, now you've got the PlayStation, play the new God of War. Right, well, they're going... releasing a TV along with everything here too. I believe that's going to be capable of graphics up to 8K. Nice. But it'll be able to do 8K, 4K, whatever you want, I believe, downward. But I, I take that personally as a kind of hint, like probably going to be able to go up to an 8K graphic if they're going to release a TV alongside it coming out. Yeah, they're future-proofing a lot of things. Smart. Do you know it's going to look damn pretty on that thing? What's that? Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh, oh, man. Monster Hunter. That too. But Final Fantasy <laughs> VII Remake. Uh, some news about that recently came forward. The demo on PS4 was apparently available through some interesting means there for a little while, and so a lot of people got a hold of the demo and were able to data mine it. So there's a lot of information out there that isn't necessarily information that Square Enix has shared themselves. So if you're in the uh, in the camp of, I want to play this game fresh, even though, you know, it is a remake, you might be familiar with it, kind of avoid those areas of the internet because there's a lot of stuff out there. I think I'm going to have to play the demo before I make a decision on 
how soon I get it. Might be smart. A lot of people are thinking this demo is going to come at the very end of January to kind of coincide with the Japanese release date. So January 31st apparently is the anniversary of the release in Japan. So hopefully we'll get it then. That seems like a good time frame for me. Gives people a couple months to kind of play it. About a month. Right. I'm honestly surprised they... If it, if, if, if it got released or how people got access to it, honestly, it probably would have been a smart decision to just make it official and just put it out there. Yeah, yeah. If I was that PR guy and people were already playing it and that information was being pulled from the game, I'd just drop the demo. Right. Now, this is coming from Heather Alexandra on Kotaku. Uh, the headline is Final Fantasy VII Remake Demo Leaks Online and Data Miners Unveil More Details. And a lot of this are, is just kind of reiterating the idea that, you know, hackers got a hold of it. They're talking about specific points. They're trying to figure out what characters are actually going to be in this build right and the best way to get a hold of ahead of a situation like that is to just make it available yeah that would have been the good call and i'm surprised that square enix didn't do that but the big thing is they're trying to confirm if like a particular character is available in this episode because the game is going to be released in chunks yeah right i wonder if maybe there was something there like something with the demo that makes it not ready yet maybe it's possible that they're creating a build of the game that literally is only the demo rather than they just blocked off certain portions. They don't want to accidentally release a version of the demo that like, oh, an hour in, it's over. But it is literally the full game with a timer on it. And if someone can figure out how to disable the timer, they literally just got the whole game. I hope to see what they do with Dragon Quest, where they are have access to the demo and your levels and stuff carry over. That would be really handy, I think. Yeah, that's true. Or at least your progress. Like, let you play the beginning Mako Reactor stuff or something, and maybe, like, an area where you can run around freely. That'd be nice. <laughs> Somebody farms the max level in fucking Shinra with level one soldiers Somebody before will. the game's even released. Somebody will. A friend of mine, when they released the demo for, I think it was Bravely Second, he maxed out his city because there's like a city builder built into the game. He completely maxed that out. So when he started the game, he had like all of these end game items because he just had fun playing like the city builder portion of the game. That was included with the demo up to its max and all that stuff carried over. Now, part of me wants to play the game as intended. So if it's something like that, I'll probably just restart. But eh, either way, that game is on our anticipated games list for me in particular because I got to play it. Well, I'm also curious if even with the Final Fantasy VII being episodic, like how long are we waiting between episodes? And is it worth just waiting for a complete edition? That mm, We'll see. I don't... I'm going to have to guess with their episodics that at least have to be seasonal. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, at yeah. the very least, because that's spacing out, you know, a solo playing game for a long distance there. But that would make the most sense unless they run into problems. They're giving themselves like an extra buffer room to be like, you know, the next episode's delayed for, you know, fixing a problem. Right. I don't think we're going to see another Final Fantasy episode in the seven universe specifically at least until a year after this one comes out personally is what i'm thinking because they're trying to expand so much to the areas that were available in the original game that it's just going to be too large of a project to release annually even maybe so i think that annually is going to be kind of pushing it but that's kind of where i expect and hope to see it i don't think we're going to get episode one three months later episode two i don't think that's happening the challenge they have is they need to add content to a game that needs to stay as people remembered it yeah they can't change an area they can add stuff to an area but they can't change it. It needs to look the same to people now as it did when they first played it in 1997 or what, whenever they played it. As long as I'm playing it like I did Resident Evil 2, that's what I want. And that's what it appeared to be in the demo that I played. But Resident Evil 2 did that. There's a lot of things that seem, that felt that still felt familiar. We're still very much a part of those things. But it was, like I said, yeah, they have this challenge of like the, the overworld map needs to feel the same, but it needs to be open world and like it's blowing up way way beyond what we ever could have imagined when the game first came out they need to fit basically final fantasy 15 into every area of the game the marketing is going to be really challenging i think for square enix in other areas of news our friends at way forward are celebrating an anniversary with way forward day which is going to be a collaboration between them and limited run games that's happening on january 17th and for this they have basically three games on offer that you can pre-order and that includes their upcoming vitamin connection which they did have at pax i've seen it played it looked cute enough i didn't spend time with it but it was there uh mighty switch force collection which is a collection 
collection, you can get standard or collector's edition for vitamin connection, and that's specifically on Switch. Now, for Mighty Swiss Force collection, that's the Switch PS4. You get standard or collector's edition options, and you can load up on limitedrungames.com or WayForward website to see what's included in these collections. The other game they have, which I didn't really have any information on, was Mystic Bell, which is a game that looks to have a bunch of flavors of, like, Harry Potter. The The main school that the character is in is kind of play a play off Hogwarts, and that's a PS4 game. You can only get it standard, though. You can also get the Mighty Switch Force Collection vinyl soundtrack during Way Forward Day, and Vitamin Connection and a River City Girls Switch carrying case as well. That's exciting. I'm I'm really excited for anything around River City Girls after we've got to spend time with it and have the interview with them. Oh, it was really fun. I love Way Forward. They don't put out a bad product. Almost every game they play is at least good enough. Now, Zach, this is one that I'm not going to be able to touch probably until we get some sort of cross save because I have so much time invested in the PS4 version. But our favorite game is getting expanded on PC. Mm-hmm. Monster Hunter Iceborne is hitting PC. And it's you said available now? Yes, it is available as of like last Friday or something. Last yeah, Friday. I am off. Few days. I'm off by like a week or two. I thought it was closer to the end of the month. <laughs> But no, that's exciting. Yeah. Monster Hunter looks super nice on play or PlayStation on PC over PlayStation. Yeah, I'm incredibly unmotivated to get the PC version because I'd have to start all over. Exactly. And I don't Same. want to. <laughs> Same. Which is why I think that when they start syncing the content, which they said they're going to do, because right now it's staggered. Console players get their extra monsters and weapons and stuff a little earlier than PC players. And once that schedule syncs, I think that's when we're going to get cross-play, cross-save. I hope so, because it would be fantastic. And it's not like they can't do a cross-play, because they did Wii U to DS, or no, they- 3DS, and, and that's how we played Monster Hunter 3. That's how I got really, really into Monster Hunter. That's where I got good at Monster Hunter. Uh, well, at least for sure, cross-save. Being able to finish, like, saving your character on PlayStation 4, hitting the sync button, hitting download or sync on your PC. and Because even if cross... Like, I understand cross-play being difficult especially with mods being available on pc but yeah i think that cross save is, should be definitely doable yeah cross progression cross save should be easily done it, everybody's able to pull out something like that i mean even now with destiny being so big you can completely cross progress the game from console to pc Which and that's nice. a large amount of things to do in different places yeah yeah now, specific features for the PC version kind of revolve around graphics. So we get the the high-res texture pack that you can download. I think I've downloaded that for the base game, actually. You get a lot of graphic options, of course, with any PC version. Direct X12 support, optimizations for Fidelity, FX, CAS, and upscaling. I'm not familiar with what those last two are, but it's there. And revamped mouse and keyboard controls for anybody that wants to play with keyboard and mouse. I, I, maybe if I was doing bow gunning, that's where I would hang out, but like... I, I would just hook up the PS4 controller to it. Yeah, it's so easy. Yeah. Rajang will be available in February for those PC players. That's exciting. That's pretty quick for them. I haven't fought them yet in the PlayStation version. We should get back to that. Yeah, neither have I. I need to. We've we've had a lot of other things that we've like actually had to had to play. Yeah. I played Iceborne pretty heavily for about a month, and then I got swamped <laughs> with uh, some content. I think I got like two books and a game, and then about the time I finished that game, uh, I got sent another game. So because it was like the Outer Worlds, and then immediately Red Dead Redemption Two on PC, and I was just like, oh, <laughs> so many things. All of the things, none of the time. There's also a little item pack that they're giving out to PC players, which they usually do whenever an expansion drops. So it'll have like a bunch of potions and you know things to keep you going. There's also that like. Like armor and weapon set that is super good for the low level rank quests and high level rank quests to help you kind of like get through those quests a lot faster so you can get into iceborne so that's an option yeah. for anybody that wants to go that route cheaters <laughs> we, we went basically with cardboard swords <laughs> That was so fun. I learned my lesson from Tanner. I think I talked about this when we were doing our Monster Hunter talk on an episode before, is that we played with Tanner for a really long time in like G rank of Monster Hunter 3, and dude was wearing like beginner high rank armor. Oh, no. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, he honestly would be like partly his fault that we were failing quests, but then we didn't realize that he had no idea that we needed, he had already needed to hit a point where he needed to upgrade all of his stuff. And at that point we were like, oh my God, he's, he's a true wizard. He's like not dying. He's <laughs> staying alive for this long. He's within one hit all the time and he's still skirting out. It's you we're like, okay, so and he's going to be good. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what happened. After that, oh, we started just like, like rolling things. Now? Yeah, 
Yeah. No, it was fantastic. But yeah, no. So, I mean, honestly, in Monster Hunter World, I haven't upgraded my stuff supremely because I'm really stingy with resources. Yeah. I've got a sick Brachidio sword that I like. Yeah, that's like fully upgraded. Does a shit ton of blast damage. <laughs> I think I'm still using the Dragon King eye patch, though. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not a bad, bad thing to have. In some obscure news, our friends at Tiny Build just put out an update for Streets of Rogue, and this comes out of our inbox. We do get the occasional press release from some folks. So Streets of Rogue is kind of like Nuclear Throne, and Deus Ex is how they explained it, with kind of a old-school Grand Theft Auto feel, like the top-down Grand Theft Auto games. Apparently, it's their highest-rated release. People like it, and now you can make levels. Cool. There's also workshop support, so you can mod it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I love it when they add that. Adds a lot of, like... <laughs> compatibility with the game yeah like replayability creating levels and things for sharing gets people back in gets them talking like share around. I mean, look at the popularity of grand theft auto online oh. <laughs> absurd levels of popularity mostly because of yeah. the online world the modding community that type of stuff right and now it's on Game Pass. Oh, ho, more players. Yes, people who didn't buy it before can now play it. And all, all those kids Xbox who players. couldn't play it before because their parents wouldn't buy it for them can now play it. Yeah, yeah. Mommy, I want to buy Grand Theft Auto. No, you're not 18. All right, I want Game Pass. <laughs> All right, little Billy. Uh, the, parental, the parental options in, all, in most things, they, I think the game rating is tied to the game itself. Oh, yeah. So if, you, if you're if you a parent and set up, bother to set up the parental controls, you can lock them out of games. What parents actually do that? Still, most parents that are like supporting like their kids gaming don't know how there's to use computers reason, half the time. There's a reason my credit card has not been active charged for four hundred dollars worth of video games because you mean four hundred dollars worth of fortnite skins <laughs> you need a you need a password in order to make a purchase on on pretty much any of my consoles and yeah if you take the time those to passwords. do it parental support is really really nice it actually doesn't take any time at all nah, it's kind of funny either. the number of parents that don't bother i don't know mad. how many that i talk to or just they have no clue how to do it and they're like no nah, it's too complicated i'm not gonna it's do not, it and i'm like it, man you literally just hit the button and it goes all right Here's what it does. Here's how you do it. Yep. You and set if, your sensitivity. For, yeah, for parental things. But for anything, I mean, just open up a YouTube video and it'll walk you through with pictures yeah. how to do it. Moving but, pictures. <laughs> but, pictures. Sound, usually. <laughs> and, and with that, let's jump into our main topic, gentlemen. We have the most anticipated games of 2020. We have yet to give out our 2019 accolades. That is in the works. We're going to have that soon, probably by around the end of the month, give or take. Yes. But as far as games coming out in 2020, we have a super list. So we're just going <laughs> to kind of touch on these and give a quick little blurb about them and move on because there's a lot of games coming out. There's a lot of games that look pretty great, and we're going to touch on them as best we can. So who wants to start? I mean, mine aren't on this super list that you have written, so maybe I'll just add mine. Yeah, you can add it later for the people that actually look at the show notes. I don't know if those people exist, but it's available. <laughs> <laughs> but no, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and start with yours, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll start with the... I'll, I'll end on my most anticipated. Sure. But kind of looking looking at some games last night i was looking at kind of like games that are scheduled for 2020 and then i specifically typed in for indie games because sometimes they get lost yeah in the shuffle of in the hype of other games and some of these games are worth being just as excited about uh but two games that stuck out to me is there's one called uh eastward okay which oh is yeah a, uh kind of a, a throwback to 16-bit RPGs. It definitely feels like like the art style wise and uh, just the feel of it is very much Mother 3. Okay. I don't know if you guys have seen anything from that game at all. I played the first hour. <laughs> so it, it definitely has that feel to it. It looks beautiful. Really fantastic pixel art. Looks like it's going to have a lot of like fun, like animated moments. Published by Chucklefish. <laughs> Oh, nifty. And then kind of in that same vein, uh, but uh, with more of like a 2D anime art style is uh, Chris Tales. I've seen this one. Yep. Which also looks just beautiful. A lot of like this, this kind of art style games where it's just like a 2D drawn sprite versus a pixel sprite. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, eh, I'm not really feeling it. But this one reminds me a lot of, um, is it uh, Child Indivisible? Of that too, but Child of Light it gets compared to a lot as well. Mm. So Indivisible is, I think it's closer to, it kind of has the first kind of a feel of like there's a Legend of Zelda kind of clone game called Blossom and the Legend of the Sleep King or something like that. The art style 
looks kind of familiar, similar to that as well. So those are the two like indie games that popped up that I just like locked in on and really thought were pretty exciting. And then a bigger JRPG that I'm excited about, Tales of Arise. Okay. Looks like it's it visually is going to be one of the best looking JRPGs with the kind of cell shaded kind of like that specific look coming out next year. I'm a pretty big Tales of fan and it's been a few years. And so they've really like, it looks like visually they've built a new engine or built assets up in a new engine that they had been using for a long time and uh, was starting to look a little dated. What was the Tales of title again? Tales of Arise. Gotcha. Tales of Arise. And then uh, one of the, I don't remember when they announced it, but when they showed it to me, I was just like, I, this is a game I have to play. Ghost of Tsushima. Yes. Ghost of Tsushima. Oh, we don't have that on our list, but yeah. I was going to put it, but like, there's some other ones that I'm more excited about, but I am very much pumped to play this. It's at the top of my list. Like they did the whole scene with these two samurai are sh- staring daggers at each other and these like flaming leaves fall around them or these leaves are swirling around them and it just like blew me away with the environmental effects that they they built and they really seem to be weighing heavily on like the traditional japanese filmmaking for samurai movies with that tension built yeah in how combat works and things like that it just looks really great and then uh for my most anticipated game writing the top games of the decade for marooners rock and i was thinking about the 10 games that i had picked And one game stuck out the most to me as like just the way it impacted me personally, The Last of Us. Right on. Playing that game, I wept. I had been a father for like three or four months and it just struck that chord. And despite the fact I'm not a big horror game fan or stealth game fan, I got through that game and I loved it. And it just really hit a chord with me. So I am very excited for The Last of Us Part 2. And that's at the top of my my list there i'm excited to see what the next chapter is going to bring unfortunately that means that i might be setting myself up for some disappointment if it's not like because it's so hot like i'm just so hyped for it that if i finally play it and it's not extraordinary i might be kind of but (laughs) i'm still very excited about it we'll see if my wallet will allow me to buy any of them (laughs) (laughs) march beware the ides of march yeah, uh-huh. that's true. March is huge. Um, Doom Eternal, Final Fantasy, Cyberpunk, Animal Crossing also is coming out this year. And like yeah, Animal April, Crossing. Man. Yeah, but it's Animal Crossing's March, Doom's March, Final Fantasy's March, Cyber Cyberpunk March too. It used to be March. I think, I think it got delayed a couple months. Can- Kong okay. vs. Godzilla was also slated to be in March. Has since been moved to November twentieth. That's smart of them. Yes, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. So the Last of Us is or. Er, Cyberpunk is hitting April 16th. Oh, that's okay. two days after my birthday. Ooh. That's still real early coming right off of March, too. Mm-hmm. Man, there's everybody's going to have a hard-hitting end of the summer season of it. I don't know what the end of the year is going to look like. It's going to be a lot of hype building for the new consoles, I think. Yeah, I think so. True. It's nifty that March has snuck up on us. You know, the last two years have been like, March was interesting. March was pretty good again this year. Now this year, it's going to be like, March is going to be too fucking busy this year. Well, a couple years ago, they had the Switch and Breath of the Wild come out in March. And then another year, we had like Nier Automata. And I think Final Fantasy came out in a March as well. Final Fantasy 15. A lot of my favorite, like most anticipated games have been hitting in March. Hmm. I'm guessing there's like a financial reason. Get those sales in early for that quarter, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they might be releasing because it was like a low earning quarter and they're just trying to raise the sales for that one and for some reason everything's spiking on the same time or maybe march is a good projection for how the rest of the year is gonna go yeah they can use those numbers to mark how you can correct course maybe gives you time to maybe still hit hit those goals that's Uh, true it depends on their fiscal years i mean my my work our fiscal year is october to october so mine's july to july i think maybe it's possible that the video game industry works on a specific schedule zach what you got for 2020 for 2020 starting on like the lower end of things i'm excited about was seeing new world okay at least the trailers of it looked fantastic it's gonna be an mmo rpg which i'm a little more sad about because really good looking like intro stuff for mmo rpgs are usually fantastic and then the gameplay and the world just kind of like subpar out 
Yeah. I was really hoping it was just going to be like, you know, a single player RPG. And it was that would have been gorgeous, but it looks beautiful uh, and it's got a really cool concept. I just don't know how it's going to be an MMORPG till we get a whole lot more information on it. Probably the biggest release to come out of Amazon Game Studios so far. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'm still super hyped for Spirit Fair. Yeah. Because it has such a beautiful and unique approach to death in a game. And it's just going to make you feel so much stuff through the entire time i want to cry i want to cry yeah you're gonna cry sad and happy at the same time and be so confused probably emotionally exhausted but wanting to come back for more i played it i chatted with uh that's the only interview i lost from pax i don't know why but it corrupted and didn't work that was a great conversation things look really really good for it i don't think the gameplay is gonna wow people but i think the like the art style the music everything else is gonna really floor a bunch of players oh absolutely but uh top of my list is probably gonna be hollow knight silk song mm, yes. i got so so drawn into hollow knight and that's my first 10 of 10 game period i can't argue with it too much there's some hard parts it's just good uh <laughs> it's good it's solid i i can't argue against it very very much. Um, well, it looks like based I, on your notes, they're taking a bit of a shovel knight kind of approach. Originally, with how they took their yes, they took their antagonist and made them their own campaigns. Yeah, if it's starring an antagonist from Hollow Knight, they're kind of like, all right, this has worked mm-hmm. for other franchises. Let's you know, people like this character. Let's give them their own game. Let's yeah. let's feed the, the fan base even further. So originally, we kind of thought it was a DLC, but it had expanded into a full blown sequel, and that's how they're marketing it as a sequel. Yeah, so continuing the same continuity of the world, mm-hmm. it's going to be right. great. Slightly and, different, but I just meant in terms of like yeah, yeah, yeah. placing an ant- previous antagonist, yeah. protagonist role. Yeah, Hornet is one of the characters you meet early on, too. Yeah, I haven't she's... actually played the game, so I've heard it's good. I've got to about Hornet, it's about as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> I've beat everything but the like hard platforming area that's like just hard. It's, there's not a whole lot of fun about it. It's just hard, but you get like an extra little cutscene for it. Would you say it's Super Metroid Impossible ROM hack hard? Probably Celeste Side C hard. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you're not allowed to touch the ground for the entire thing. Uh, uh. You can do it. And I've made it 1 20th of the way through. That's something. (laughs) Ah, Yeah. But you're like climbing, falling. You got to hit these like bugs that are flying in the air that when you hit them, they split and then you can't hit it again. So you can't come back and just bounce yourself in spot. You have to get it in one fluid motion hmm. which is why i can't do it because i'm not that platformer yet sounds like that rom hack that i think glitch cad mate called a uh, thumb shredder it's just repeated shell jumps forever <laughs> and mario so i'm not usually a big platformer guy playing through the shovel knight games has really like upped my game in terms of platform ability and being able to read a screen because you have to in order to make progress in a lot of situations oh definitely i bought it for playstation early on when it came out and we just shovel got mm-hmm, and we just got stuff for the new shovel knight expansion so i'm replaying oops, i hit my mic <laughs> replaying through it on um steam so that i can get the full experience again with everything along with alex yeah i have beat all four campaigns at least the first time through i haven't been able to do that yet but what i've played so far and what i've seen so far it, it doesn't seem to ever drop in quality if you get a chance specter knight is the shortest one i think i beat it in like four to five hours it was like an evening. <laughs> I mean, awesome. so far what I've played, I mean, I think I'm, I'm about, I've played for about 25 hours, so I don't know. If, maybe I just suck. I don't know. <laughs> One of the best values in gaming. Super, super cool. But yeah. Uh, and then of course for me, I just love the idea of Ghost of Shusima. I really want to see more of it. Yeah. And I'm just, just the little bits of tease are enough for me. I just keep getting, I keep forgetting about it because I'm not hearing enough I, about it, I, but I don't want to hear I too much. I talk to someone about PlayStation games, Ghost of Tsushima, and uh, did you pick up the uh, the free dynamic PlayStation theme no. that they released? I don't really chase Mm-mm. themes much. Uh, I just I happened to see like a, a tweet about it, and you put in you basically put in a, a code or whatever, and it gave you the, this free theme or whatever, and it is basically the lone the main character standing in a silhouette in the distance holding a sword and it's just golden leaves Ooh, cool. like a forest scene all around them and the leaves are blowing and it's really cool i don't know if it's still available so alex what are yours well i mean things that are indie since y'all are leading with indie there's a couple little things that i want to touch on 
Uh, Spirit Fair, I'm super looking forward to. I can't wait to play that. Axiom Verge is getting a sequel, and it's also being solo developed entirely by the one guy, Tom Happ. So music, game design, pretty much everything aside from some of the marketing and like just getting people to play it, that's all one dude. And so Axiom Verge 2 looks really, really cool. The benefit at this point for a sequel is that a lot of the assets he already has for like in terms of like sprites and graphics and things like that. So if he's using like a builder, he's not having to rewrite code unless he's adding functionality or improving something. So he's not, he's probably not building it from scratch is my guess. Well, now graphics, it's, like a 16-bit approach rather than a like high-end 8-bit approach. It's a lot easier to um, program or use those assets these days, though, in a high bit. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, regardless, it looks really, really cool. It looks less bleak than the original game. Like, we're getting a lot of winter scenes in the in the previews. A lot of really cool monsters, really complex sprite work. So I'm, I'm stoked. I love Axiom Verge. It's one of my favorite games. I never finished it, but I, I thought it was really, really cool. Hollow Knight Silk Song, I'm up there for. Haven! That game that really made an impact on me at PAX West, I'm really looking forward to. Because it's kind of a Persona-style JRPG, but the big appeal to it is this, like, really meaningful approach to relationships, right? So you get this this couple, and you're kind of living their day-to-day -day life, and then you have to go out into this sci-fi world to get, like, resources or something. And you have to, like, fight monsters and such. And there's a co-op option, too. That's another game I hope to cry on, because it and Spirit Fair are two games that, like, I want to really get invested in emotionally. Other than that, it's Remake City for me. Final Fantasy VII Remake, <laughs> I am stoked for. I played the demo at PAX. The cutscenes in particular are really moving, and the way the, like, the music hits, it's just super cool for fans of that game. And I've been a long-time Final Fantasy fan ever since I was, like, 10, and... The combat felt really cool when I played it. Tactically, there's a lot of, like, engagement through an entire battle. I never felt bored in, like, a 10 to 15 minute long boss battle, so that was really impressed with that. We'll have to see if this is the version of the game that makes me finally care about this. I love Eris, personally. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of Eris. I She was the character that I shoved in the back. I just thought she was flat. But I was also, like, in my early 20s when I finally played that game. Oh, I was a youngin'. Well, I was like 16, probably. Having played a lot of other games before then and going back and playing this like old PS1 RPG, because while everyone else was playing Final Fantasy VII, I was playing Legend of Dragoon. <laughs> <laughs> a which more Dragoon does have fan. A, which does have a character death that I did care about. Yeah, yeah. That was my first ever experience with character death in a video game, actually. Because I played 7 after after Dragoon as well, because I got like 8 and 9, 7, Dragoon, a bunch of these JRPGs kind of all at once. I love Dragoon so much. It's so good. I want to see some kind of affirmation that they're doing something with that game in Sony, because Dart as a character was involved in like this holiday artwork that they put out. Dart's there. He's in the background. <laughs> There's a bunch of rumors that the people that did uh the Shadow of the Colossus remake are doing something with Legend of Dragoon, and I think that's a great team to stick it with. Uh, they're just making a new PlayStation All Stars. Oh, no, interesting. No, he was no. He was I'm just. <laughs> I'm saying. I'm dashing. I'm dashing. We don't need that. I just want to play it on Switch, honestly. Like, I I love playing it on the Vita or the PSP, but like on the Switch would be super cool. <laughs> I would play through it three more times. Other than that, Remake City, Resident Evil Three. I'm stoked for Resident Evil Two Remake was one of the games that like I wish I would have played when it came out because I just got to it recently and it's incredible front to back. It's very very good. It's really challenging in parts, especially the like extra character campaigns. And so I'm excited to see what. Capcom does specifically with Resident Evil 3 because I've never played that one. So I'm excited for Resident Evil 3 remake. I definitely hope to get it and Final Fantasy day one. Mm. There's one other game too. I'm surprised you didn't mention, Zach. It's from our friends. Friends? Well, we don't know. We them, don't have friends. But I would like to be friends with them. The From Software people <laughs> are making another game with George R. R. Martin called Elden Ring. I'm here for it. <laughs> oh, I'm really, really here for it too. I'm not a big Martin fan, truth be told, but I like the idea of them working together. Yes. Uh, I'm a fan in the fact that he can describe so much food I don't want to read anymore and want to go eat. But <laughs> the game looks great. And that's uh, I have the trailer playing because I don't think you guys can see it directly above. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's going to be one of those games that like has a lot of cool imagery and such. And I just hope that it's everything that this trailer kind of like plays with 
on the imagination level, right? I'm I'm hoping so. It's exciting, and there's a lot of uh lots of size, lots of uh different things about characters. Like this guy hammering away, he has this cracked back, and I don't know if those are like scars, a tattoo, something cracked into him. Like I'm I'm not sure. And it looks like he's cracking more as the scene goes on. I didn't did not notice that before until right now. I kind of hope they take the approach they did with Sekiro where you have like an actual main plot line. But I also just kind of want anything from that company right now. <laughs> right now, I love From. And it's it's hard. People want to bash their head off of things sometimes. But I love it. It's super good. I would like them to release a game I can beat. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I don't have the patience for a lot of these I things. I think taking the Jedi Fallen Order approach would be really, really cool. That would get a lot of players playing it. Granted, I think that like being in the mindset of being forced to play a particular way in a From Software game or like not being able to take the easy route, I also like that as a design statement. Yeah, well, you know, then there's people who uh, speedrun it in 28 minutes. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with those games, but I kind of would like to see that difficulty approach because I, I think it works really well in Fallen Order. And then the last game we have listed that nobody brought up was Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk looks kind of cool. I'm excited specifically to play it on PC, but I don't know if I'm going to get it day one. It looks cool, but it's not at the top of my, like, it's not on my anticipated, primarily yeah. because I'm not a, the biggest open world fan. Cyberpunk is, as a, like, a setting isn't as engaging to me as, like, The Witcher was with a fantasy setting i'm excited because there's not a lot of games i've played in cyberpunk so i'm i'm pumped to see how that goes i'm interested in it to see how good the game's gonna look in game i don't want to see any more trailer stuff i want to get in there taste it and be tangible with it uh and i'm hoping that it does not <laughs> hoping that it does not have repetitive dumb shit yeah. Like, say, original Assassin's Creed. Oh. You did the exact same like Gwent in a different skinned city. Like, that's always my, like, I, I just, it's just my horror scenario for when I end up with open world games. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. So that really kind of drives us to the end of our most anticipated games of 2020. There's plenty more that I think that we'll find excitement over over the coming months. But if you have a game that we should really pay attention to, please send us an email. Hit us with a tweet or something. Let us know about it in some way, shape or form. You can also join our discord, too. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a game, talk to us about it. Yeah, if you're a so developer or something, get it. in touch with us because we love doing that sort of thing. Let's move on to some listener and reader uh, statements, suggestions and and just some straight up emails that I forgot to read that came in in November back when this game was announced. So I guess we'll start there. John, no, Justin from the Here's Johnny podcast, the really excellent horror podcast that covers games and films. And they're my favorite like horror related thing to listen to aside from something that's actually a narrative. And so Justin was like, hey, guys, it's me, Justin from the Here's Johnny podcast. Wanted to know what your all's thoughts was on Half-Life Alex, that new VR project. And personally, I think that they are using this to get Half-Life back into the minds of gamers. And we just might see the fabled Half-Life 3. Now that would be a miracle. Curious to hear what you guys think about the title itself and the timing of it all. So what do you all think about Half-Life Alex? Because I have some thoughts, but I, I looked at some supplementary things. I am curious to see if it was something that they've had kind of cooking for a while and they were waiting for something like the right timing to get the idea they had out. How much attention are they going to put into making it an actual part of this franchise? Or is it kind of like the middle, was it Metal Gear Rising? Oh, like a spinoff kind of thing? Yeah. Right, where it's just like, all right, we have this idea for a game, but we're not exactly sure about the idea. And slap on some like Metal Gear aesthetic and make it to try and sell this game. Which I've heard overall, there's a, you know, it's kind of split, but a lot of people did like it still. And so it worked out for them. But it was vastly different, like in terms of feel and overall like aesthetic yeah that was a platinum design game so it plays like a bayonetta or something right yeah it was specifically not tactical espionage action it was i can't remember it had a different subtitle <laughs> yeah 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 so it was to help yeah. differentiate itself from things I think that project's really cool. I can't wait to play that one, actually. It it does look fun. I'm just curious as to how how involved it will be in being a Half-Life game 
versus just a VR game that they're using Half-Life to sell. Right. Now, I'm not a big Half-Life fan. I've made that pretty clear in a lot of different areas, including the podcast. I find it incredibly boring overall. But it's interesting to see like a major player in the VR space really kind of put their chips on the table with a big franchise like this. So I really want to see how that plays out because all the trailers and stuff, this looks super detailed. It looks like the technology is evolved into a place that it's like heightening the actual gameplay scenarios because it's in vr and so i think that this is a game that i will personally enjoy way more than a traditional half-life and it is going to be available on all steam-based vr platforms so anything that you can get into steam with you'll be able to play this game of course the best experience is going to be the valve index which is the super expensive really high-end level machinery but overall i think it's going to be really good i'm i'm interested to see more of how it's going to play uh, I think one, it's a great foray into VR. Two, it could be, it could easily be something that they are gauging on the actual interest into Half Life with. So you know, say Alex does really good, that might put them into making a a another or B trying to revive the series. But I would ultimately think that if it generated enough interest, they might just reboot Half Life. Oh, like re-release the first two? Yeah, or remaster them or remake them like the other games are getting remade now. And from there, continue the story. Not been confirmed yet, but I do believe that Half-Life Alex will eventually find its way to the PlayStation VR ecosystem. Okay. Because of that huge player base, specifically. That would be really smart of them. I don't think it's going to be even within the year that it comes out. It might come out at the end of the year for PlayStation, or it might come out when PlayStation 5's VR system is available, because they did confirm that like your old headset will work, and they're going to do a new version of the headset and probably some different controllers and that type of thing. The thing that's interesting, when this trailer first dropped, there was a interview that Jeff Keighley of the Game Awards put out that was pretty in-depth, like sitting down and talking to the developers about Half-Life Alex. And kind of the the thought process that brought him to it. So I highly recommend chasing down that video. I I don't remember the exact title of it, but I'll find it eventually and put it in the show notes. But uh, it's pretty cool because they're kind of afraid, it seems, of Half-Life because there's that huge expectation, right? So this is kind of Valve getting back into a AAA space without having to really kind of like make that huge investment and make that that just like monumental leap to what they're doing currently. But they have been playing around with a lot of game design things, apparently, in like their lab, so to speak. And it just kind of made sense for them to make their VR project all these different features that they wanted to hit into a Half-Life game. And they've even experimented with things like what would a Left 4 Dead look like in VR and that type of stuff. So there's all these little prototypes of their properties probably floating around. Yeah, see, I don't want to even see them necessarily tinker with getting into a AAA space with this, especially if they're scared of it. Because, I mean, even today, Left 4 Dead still has a lot of players for it, just because what it is. I mean, you just run through each level, doing what you can. And I think if they just released another one of those, maybe not rehash the old stuff, but I think that would be their like money spot to get them back in and then jump into something with a little bit more confidence. I personally believe that half-life alex has all the potential in the world to be like a killer app for vr i think that you know it's got all the right components to really kind of knock it out of the park it's a matter of how are people going to respond to this is it the right time does it work well on all the lower end steam vr things like what's the area of getting people into the game and then once that is kind of pegged then we'll know i don't think it's going to do well initially i think over time it'll do better provided it's quality that's fair. I'm excited to play it, even though I don't really have a way to do that at the moment. Yeah, I, I don't own any VR yet. It's it's. You can technically hook up the PSVR to the PC, and it's a pretty straightforward process. I just haven't done it. It's a lot of like third-party software. Gotcha. We also had a person on Twitter suggest us a couple games to check out. This is WTF Famicom. So WTF Amicom, what the Famicom. They suggested Death Spank the Baconing, which is a game in the, like, it, it kind of comes from the Xbox 360 era of the arcades. That's where Death Spank initially 
dropped was the like 360 download space and i've played that briefly but it's like a hack and slash kind of platforming sort of thing but apparently there's a new er one that he suggested and then they also suggested tron runner which i believe is a mobile game in the tron universe and as far as guests they would like to see us talk to the person specifically that operated the animatronic controls for goro in the 1990s mortal kombat movie and i don't even have a name yet i i looked around and like imdb and didn't find anything initially so if we can get that person's name and they're still around uh it'd be a cool conversation i think that would be really interesting actually i'd love to get some puppeteers or animatronic controllers on especially if we could get the people that do like that twitch puppet show uh i don't remember the name of that anyways there's this really famous like twitch puppet show that's really fun if you type in twitch puppet show you'll probably find it <laughs> <laughs> so like people like those people or the the folks that like controlled yoda in the new star wars movie would be really neat so i don't know we're always interested in new guest opportunities well yeah and there's also the or maybe you mentioned this and i just missed it the um dark crystal yeah new series yeah that would be some cool folks to talk mm. to. I played the game. The game has potential. It was in a little bit of a rough state when I played it, but that game is also coming out this year. Cool, cool. Mm. So let's wrap up with uh, what we've been playing. Joe, there's a guest of honor today, my friend. Yeah, I didn't even know this was coming. <laughs> so I'm kind of like a little bit in some catch-up mode in a sense because this last year was pretty busy with reviews, and so a lot of games that I've been intending play kind of got put to the side and right now i'm actively playing horizon zero dawn for the first time mm. i'm really enjoying it overall but i am already feeling that open world fatigue that makes me not really get into open world games just regardless of how much i like them i just get fatigued and i'm just like there's too many things and i like i want to move on to an another game and then I'm also recently started Final Fantasy X for the first time. I first borrowed a copy from a friend back when it was still fresh, about an hour into the game, well, not even an hour, before the first save point. The game froze up and wouldn't play anymore. I couldn't make progression. Tried three or four more times to get past that point. The game just would not load even after cleaning. And so I gave it back and then never touched it again. So found a copy for a decent price at a game shop, decided, uh, you know what? for it'll be a good streaming game because it'll be a game that i can chat with the watch or the audience easily and uh i can uh enjoy this game for the first time maybe get some insight from people who played it when it was fresh versus versus playing the hd version and what sort of things i can expect i know that it's a lot of people's first final fantasy just like seven was because it's the first on a console yeah it's a big launch point for a lot of people yeah mm -hmm. so it's kind of got I would say in terms of popularity, you have seven, probably have 10, like in terms of recognition. Um, and then, you know, in terms of fi for Final Fantasy fans after that point, you've got six and nine way up there in the list too. But yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Still working my way through some Shovel Knight. So yeah, that's basically what's on my, my list right now is Horizon Zero Dawn and Final Fantasy X. Zach, what you got, man? We're all playing Shovel Knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, of course, playing Shovel Knight for review, getting everything checked out with it, because I, like I said earlier in the show, played it when it first came out, mainly because Travis was super into Shovel Knight, like before it came out, after it came out, and continuously, so he got me really into it, and we got the codes to do it for the new expansion stuff, so I'm replaying through everything. It's interesting. It's nice, a nice revisit. I'm not very far into the campaign I'm on, but it's just like this nice blast from the past again, and Shovel Knight's everywhere. We had a long talk about that recently, too, but... It's exciting. I just finished playing through Outer Wilds for the PS4, not to be confused with Outer Worlds, which is Space Fallout. Unfortunate timing and naming. Yep, confused me. For yeah. the Outer Wilds, because Outer Worlds had some hype to it. The kind of like shots fired between Obsidian and Bethesda. Because <laughs> the first time someone said Outer Wilds, I immediately thought they just mispronounced the game or something. Right, yeah. But it was amazing. The story is fantastic. You have to go find it. They don't give you any of it. It's just you go out and explore at your own pace. But you're going to die every 22 minutes and have to do it again. It's like Majora's Mask. Yeah, but you don't lose any progress that you learn. Oh, so all the stuff Majora's that you learn, mask, but you keep. Space. Uh, and it's great. I mean, you're not fighting enemies. There's really no enemies. You're just learning about it. And it's 
beautiful. The music's fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to rant about that in the uh, review itself, but it's really emotional. It's like low key. Like as you start getting through the story, you start getting like a lot of really emotional things from it until it ends in such a nice relieving package. Very cool. And then I'm playing seven days to die because I've got really back into this zombie train. I've always been an avid zombie fan of some sort and I really liked the game before. So I've picked it back up on steam again and I've been playing the computer since the console's basically dead in the water until they do something with it. Yeah. The console port was really, really disappointing for that title. It, but it was what the build was at the time it was released. They just started doing it differently and then telltale like died. Super unfortunate that. So I, like I said earlier, am playing a bit of Pokemon Sword. I really enjoy the fact that there's lots of variety in the game early on, so I can build the tiny kind of team that I want to. And there's a lot of like little changes that are really nice, and some things that we're kind of missing. So hopefully that all kind of comes together with the the uh, expansion pass. And the thing that I like the most about it is when you're do- in these like gym battles, the music that kicks in with like the the background vocalist reminds me so much of Splatoon 2 and Arms that it's just really exciting. It's like a powerful like yeah kind of music. It- it's really cool. I like the gym track a lot. Yeah, it's true. They really upped the music game this generation. It's like I think a lot of people have like the classic tunes from like Red and Blue and gold and silver in terms of like oh those recognizable like little tunes after that there's like decently well-made music but nothing i really distinctly remember but then like with this game i actively noticed like oh this is a good track it's a good one i'm also playing system shock 2 on steam i'm playing that for a appearance on the here's johnny podcast it's Combat's not the best. I think so far, I prefer Bioshock and, like, the way they streamline that type of gameplay. But, like, being in a kind of screwed situation on a, like, space station or whatever, having to figure out all these little pieces, and it's got a bit of a puzzle box element to the map. So, like, the actual exploration and stuff is pretty cool, and there's a lot of different ways you can create your character. There's different abilities you get through psionics and, like, hacking and stuff, but I made the dumb decision of building a soldier dude, and (laughs) it's not great, because I basically just run around and awkwardly hit people with wrenches. There's a bunch of monkeys, too. There's a lot more monkeys than I figured there would be in System Shock. I don't like him, monkeys. They're psychic. They shoot little bubbles at you. <laughs> Evil space monkeys. And they have stock monkey noises. So it's just like, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that I'm playing on Steam is a game that we just got copies of. It's an early access game, but it's got a really cool idea. It's called Mass Builder, M-A-S-S. And so this is a mech driven, customize your own mech, get out there, fight waves and waves of enemies, really fine tune what your mech looks like down to like the shape of parts and the weapons you use and things like that. So I I like what they're establishing so far. And it reminds me just a touch of Dynasty Warriors because there's a large amount of enemies that you're kind of just like mowing through. And so far, it feels pretty good. I have a question for you on that then too. Because again, I'm not super deep into it because I haven't loaded anything up on it because I'm finishing off what I have before I bite off into something else. Is the uh, I noticed as they were going through the parts, they all had a different weight. Does it affect you moving around? Uh, Probably, but I don't know to what extent yet because i built like one mech design with the parts that i had customized it real nice while watching agdq and then used that to play a couple missions so i imagine that either in the final version of the game or maybe it's just something that i haven't noticed yet based on the type of mech you build frame wise and stuff that'll have varying effects on your movements and mechanics okay seems like yeah, it took the mass effect series in a weird direction <laughs> <laughs> completely different now this is it's a really cool little game uh we're excited to maybe get the devs on but we will be doing some sort of preview content for this title because i'm in a mech mood i've been watching a lot of gundam anime i watched gundam origin i finished watching gundam double o which i didn't like but the mech designs are really cool and then i started watching gundam age which is a similar situation in all three except for gundam origin which i watched in japanese the english dub is atrocious <laughs> it is bad and lifeless in gundam double o oh my god horrible voice acting oh no they're coming right for us it's just like the most deadpan doesn't make any sense sort of writing like it's really stupid um another (laughs) game i just remembered another game that i'm actively playing through right now me and a friend love playing through co-op games together and so we recently finished resident evil 6 So we're going back and playing Resident Evil 5 right now. And we're just having a grand old time. Just, I mean, it's like nonsense. The game is ridiculous. 
it's a little weird going to five from six because the combat and the shooting in six is way more fluid and it's way more action based. And so going back to five, we're kind of like big toddlers kind of like <laughs> running around. like, Ugh. But it's, it's, we're just having a great time from the get go. You have a couple of costumes. I'm playing Chris Redfield in some Mad Max outfit. And every time he shows up on screen, I'm just giggling and we're just cracking jokes the whole time. And it, so if you're looking for a good game to just like sit down and play with a friend cooperative, either on or couch co-op, definitely highly recommend Resident Evil five. It was a good time when it first came out, too. I got that game day one. I didn't get it day one, but me and my little brother played the absolute hell out of it. And Marshall killed it. Oh, mercenary. We're playing the HD or the, the PS4 version. Same with 6. We played the PS4 version of those, too. And Some of the DLC in 5 is really cool. Yeah, just having fun with it. So in your vein of kind of like games that are games from the past that we're kind of revisiting, I am getting a bit of a history lesson in this title that was just sent to us by nis america called the psycho shooting stars alpha collection i i have it on switch i can't really say much about it it's a collection of games that are mostly already available on the switch marketplace like you can just pop in download them for six bucks but uh the psycho shooting games are very interesting it's a lot of bullet hell situations there's some options and stuff that you can do to make it a little easier on yourself but i'm having the best time in the world playing this with the flip grip which allows me to play the game in a vertical position and that's really cool because you get that original aspect ratio of a lot of those old arcade games and i just think that playing with the flip grip in in vertical mode is such a cool like novel thing that the switch can do and it's just a really exciting way to play a lot of these shooters and i hope to not only play and review this one which we'll have by tuesday I, i'm excited for the other collection that they're doing and then i want to check out some other shooters that i can play on the switch in that particular vertical style and the flip grip was like 10 bucks or something i, I got it really cheap no oh. hmm. All right. That's not a bad price for a Nintendo accessory. It was a third party made thing. So I think the folks that worked at uh, the Retronauts podcast might have even had something to do with it. If I'm not mistaken. Great show. Even better. <laughs> Fellas, that just about does it for another rip roaring episode of the Forever Classic podcast. We got Joe now, which is super cool. Great to have him on. Yeah. We're excited to see what all cool things we can do. Speaking of Joe, if people wanted to find you on the internets, where might they do that? Probably the easiest would be Twitter, which is at the Daddy Gamer, or Twitch, twitch.tv slash Daddy Gamer YT, or YouTube, youtube.com slash Daddy Gamer Reviews. Excellent. Zach, where can people find your? Of course, exquisite liar for about everything, all one word. And as always, I still haven't managed to get a hold of my one solid name on Twitter, so it's still exquisite underscore liar. I'm still pushing to get that. I should probably consider making a change on my Twitter to make it more like succinct or something. Because right now, my Twitter is the number four ever classic 105. You can also find us on Discord, which I don't think we have a custom URL for, but it's always available in the show notes. And you can catch our streams on twitch.tv slash forever classic games which may be where you're watching this live recording which you can also join have a grand old time with us uh facebook we do have a small little group there called the forever classic hub and you can always send us an email at the forever classic podcast at gmail.com and all of this is kind of living in one little space forever classic games.com check it out there's we have a patreon too you can chip us a couple bucks there if you feel so inclined, you can even get raw cuts of these episodes a little earlier than everybody else for like a $3 donation or something a month. Right. And we haven't given Patreon as much love as we've been wanting to. So we're working on revamping some of that. I just wanted to establish Patreon first. That way, at least it's there. And if we ever need it, then we have the option because eventually we will have curated advertised advertisement content here on the the podcast feeds. So the the main thing that patreon is going to really benefit from is those ad free things but a lot of the ads we're doing are going to be again curated so it's not going to be you know the typical companies and stuff that people work with get your blue apron now let's talk about your video games oh me undies i mean granted again if they came to us and we're like we'll pay you like twenty thousand dollars i'd probably do it but <laughs> here's the thing we yeah, want to like highlight some some actual game companies some projects other podcasts that we like so those are the type of things you're going to be seeing first and foremost mm -hmm. i personally though would uh have a if you just if meandies wanted to just give me some underwear they could sponsor an episode of daddy gamer 100 percent, i'd be fine with that the drawer's getting low <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i'm throwing them away a, a pair a day at this point <laughs>
<laughs> I have questions, but that I don't want answers to. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Forever Classic Games. <laughs> Great to have you guys. Of course, we're going to try to meet up a little more often. So Absolutely. Weekly, bi-weekly, something like that. Regular content is going to be posted here and there, so please look forward to those. And we do have some special guest appearances in the works for later this month. That starts hitting the fan at the end of next week, and so scheduling is going to be hilarious and hopefully my contribution noticeable increase in content rate yeah we've got three of us so between the three of us we're gonna make something yeah 50 percent better than we were before exactly precisely so again thank you for listening to the forever classic podcast as always stay cool now 50 percent better now 50 percent better